Welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to Worship with Westminster. Once more, I'm Pastor Chris Ward, and we are so glad that you have joined us. As we begin worship today, I would love for you to join me in Isaiah 60. I'm pretty sure I used this during the Christmas time, at least in one of the readings or, or whatever. Uh, but it does seem appropriate for our topic today as we talk about what it means to walk as children of the light. So again, Isaiah 60, you'll find the words on your screen. Join me in worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we come to worship, remind us that the source of light is you. You are the source of life and you are the source of love. Lord, may we, your people, reflect that light, that love, that life to this world. We ask it as we begin worship, Lord, that you would meet us here and be glorified in our time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us worship God. Good days, I've had bad days, tasted victory and defeat. I've had problems, big as planets, turned to pebbles when you speak. I've had nothing to my name, never lacked for anything, cause you were there with me. You've been my savior, sustainer. Father 
Friends, we are so grateful for you and for your generous giving in 2020. Even in this COVID year, because of your generous support, we were able to continue to fully support our mission partners, both locally and around the world. We were able to provide the story in lights this past Christmas season for our community. We were able to continue to empower and equip men and women, children and young people to be the hands, feet, and heart of Jesus Christ, wherever they are, at home, in their workplaces, where they live. Thank you for your generous giving, and we encourage you to please continue to support the work that God is doing through Westminster Presbyterian Church in 2021. Thank you so much, and God bless you. You know, the human eye's ability to distinguish between light and dark is truly remarkable. I mentioned in a sermon just a few weeks ago that our eyes can perceive the presence of a single photon, the smallest unit of light, but can also at the same time manage light that is, depending on how you measure it, a million times more intense or even a billion times. Although in that case, the eye actually has to transform itself, closing down the iris and making other structural and chemical changes within itself. I mean, the whole thing is really amazing. And yet with that amazing adaptability comes a shadow side, no pun intended. We also have this remarkable ability to deceive ourselves about what it is that we're actually seeing or how well we see. You know, I remember uh, as a kid uh, playing outside until late into the evening and then having my parents come out to holler at us that it was time for us to come in because it was getting too dark and too dangerous. To which we kids would say naturally, nah, we can see just fine even as we crashed to the ground simply because we wanted what we wanted. And so we were willing to push the limits. It wasn't dark because we said it wasn't dark had nothing to do with the actual presence of light. And that's not necessarily something that we outgrow. You know, it may not be immediately apparent, but I've actually had a broken nose or more um, specifically a deviated septum uh, since I was in high school. It was a result of an attempted trick on skis during fading light conditions on that last run of the day, one more run and thinking that I somehow could see better than I really actually could see. You know, we've all experienced times when our eyes were playing tricks on us. Although in most of those cases, it wasn't actually a problem of the eyes, but our faulty interpretation of what the eye was actually taking in or not taking in as it may be. Sometimes it was simply a result of seeing what we wanted to see. See, we are often self-deceivers. And that is one of the Apostle John's main points in today's passage. Self-deception is a reality that is a major theme in scripture. And so how can we know if we are deceiving ourselves? Remember that John is giving us a pathway through a wilderness of false teaching and the troubling pressures of life and culture that surrounded the church. And, and he was doing this in order that we might truly know God, who, good news, is actually knowable, and that we might truly know who we are, and that we might live better in fellowship together. Remember, last week, John uh, was continuing to circle around these three identities, the relationships between these identities, and all in terms of light and love and life. So these identities, the identity of God, who God is in himself, our own self-identity, who we are as individuals, and our communal reality, who we are together. Those three identities circling around love, light, and life. 
look again for those same themes and those, those same identities in our passage today. Um, as John gives us three tests to know if we are, are practicing self-deception. Three if statements that are then followed by a, but this is reality. And then three instances of really a singular hope. So again, let's continue in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through chapter 2, verse 2. Listen for the word of God. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him to a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father God, come and reveal yourself again to us that we might see more clearly who you are, the light that flows from you, and in that light, see more clearly who we are, that we might do better at living with one another. We pray this again in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So last week, uh, we ended with John's insistence that there is an important message that he just must share and that we also must share for our joy to be complete. That message is rooted in the identity of a God who can be known. God himself has come to us in Jesus Christ. He took flesh among us and that in him is love and light and life. And this, John says, is the message. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. Now, this focus on light and darkness is not a new theme that John is making up here. It's found throughout scripture from Genesis on and especially is seen in the Psalms and the prophets and and Proverbs. Uh, The prophets, especially where it takes on special significance as it points towards God's salvation and the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Darkness throughout scripture is used as an image of what is wrong with the world, our brokenness, our human frailty. Again, darkness itself is not necessarily bad, but it's used as an image for what is wrong. I think that we tend to be a bit distanced from this as a metaphor in our modern world where, you know, the simple flip of a switch can so easily banish the darkness. But the next time there's a power outage, just soak in that feeling, that that feeling of the loss of control. You know, darkness reminds us that we are vulnerable, that we are limited. This is an instinctive feeling for us as a species, right? It's not that we're necessarily afraid of the dark, but that we know that darkness is complicated, that it can hide things, things that can trip us up or holes that we can fall in or, or evil things that might hunt us down. Right? We might not see it in our modern, electrified, convenient world, but step into the wilderness at night without a flashlight and you will quickly feel your limitations. Darkness reminds us that we are vulnerable. Light, on the other hand, is used as a reminder of God's loving presence and care. God's power to step into our situation and rescue us. His his word is light that guides us. It keeps us safe. His wisdom is reflected in light. God's goodness, God's character, all of these are, are 
light is used to describe them all. And light, in turn, is then used to direct God's people, to move us forward. Like, for example, Psalm 119, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Or Psalm 43, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. See, God as light is a theme that is reiterated throughout Scripture, and it's reiterated by Jesus himself. It is, in fact, one of the seven great I am statements that we hear from Jesus. John 8, 12, uh, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, being with Jesus means being in the light because he is the embodiment of God's light. A reflection that we see in, in John 1, in him was light and that light was the life of men. Jesus comes back to that theme again in John 12 when he talks about the struggle against the darkness that he has come to push back and that that darkness is pushing against him even now. This is what he says, uh, John 12, 35. Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. The scripture goes on to tell us that as we get closer to God through Jesus Christ, we ourselves become children of light. And, and as an extension, light for the world. I mean, just, Jesus explicitly says this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, you are the light of of the world. This means that we are meant to display God's wisdom, God's goodness, God's word, God's character in our own lives as children of light. It's a theme that's picked up by the Apostle Paul who, who writes this in Ephesians 5, for you were once darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. So this is the message. God is light. And those who walk with God will be walking in light. That is, we will be walking in God's character which then leads us to John's first test here. John reminds us that those who claim fellowship with God, but who are not walking in the light, not displaying God's character, are instead displaying a fundamental inconsistency. And therefore, no matter what they may claim, they are not children of light. They are instead proclaiming their own self-deception, he says. In other words, there are people who claim to be Christian, who put on the name of Christian, who are deceiving themselves and often are deceiving others. And John is warning the church against them. They continue to walk in darkness. John is really clear. There really are those who claim to be Christians, but who show that in their living, they really are not. They are lying. Now, sometimes they are purposely lying to the world in order to use the Christian faith for their own ends. And believe me, history as well as our own contemporary world are full of people who have used Christianity to gain what they want for themselves. For whether that's power or wealth or uh, influence or comfort or pleasure, whatever it is, even just a position to say what they want, they use Christianity. For them, Christianity was not about faith. It was a means to an end, a tool that they used for themselves. They said the right words. They proclaimed the right slogans. They lived lives, however, that were inconsistent with that same message with the heart of Jesus Christ. And so they are, John says, liars. And the truth is not in them. 
On the other hand, there are many who are simply lying to themselves. They're trying to gain certainty or security or an, an eternal reward while having no desire to actually walk with Jesus. The world is full of those who want the benefits of Jesus without wanting Jesus, who want heaven or their own version of heaven, but don't actually want to walk with God. And in both cases, that deception is made obvious by a lack of consistency in the person's walk, a lack, uh, as Jesus puts it, of, of the fruit that they show. We are known by, he says, our fruit. It brings to mind the terrifying words that Jesus says in in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He goes on to then say there are going to be all sorts of people who come along claiming to have done things in Jesus' name. And then he says this, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's terrifying. If the words are right, but the walk is wrong, John says, do not listen to them. They are not with the Lord. They are deceivers. If the message is true, but the methods are inconsistent with the character of the message, with the character of Jesus, these people are liars. They are not walking in the light. John says they are deceivers and they are deceived. The truth is not in them. This is hard stuff. You know, we always need to be aware in ourselves and in others when the inner subject of the message is inconsistent with the outer substance of the faith or of the walk, a reflection of Jesus. It has to be consistent all the way through. You know, those who claim the name of Jesus but who foster hate or who have a violent disposition or are self-centered or show a lack of concern for those around them, those who embrace pride and power instead of the humble character of Christ, those who display the character of the world instead of the fruit of the Spirit, they are not walking in the light. John says they are deceived and often they are deceivers sometimes intent on using the faith for their own personal gain. And for the record, I have seen this in action in both those who claim the political, social, or theologically conservative agendas and those who claim the political, social, or theologically progressive agendas. Those who would spout holiness of of God with hateful words while abandoning the absolute love displayed in Jesus Christ and those who proclaim the easy love of God with casual familiarity while absolutely abandoning any semblance of the very holiness that demanded that God send Jesus Christ as an atoning sacrifice in the first place. They are both deceived. There is no particular group of people who have a lock on self-deception. In fact, all of us have the ability within us to twist the words of life to best fit our own particular desires. So we always need to be careful. Coming back to the consistency, the character of Jesus Christ. You know, a a great example of this for me that I I got to see like in a compressed time frame was uh, when I was still in seminary. I was a representative of the seminary to our general assembly that was meeting at at the time, the the denomination we were in. Uh, And each uh, on the agenda, there were some pretty difficult topics, including some very touchy conversations on things like sexual ethics. So each day on my way into these meetings, I passed uh, members of the infamous uh, Westboro Baptist Church on the outside. They are well known uh, worldwide, unfortunately, through the media uh, for their their espousal of hatred. So they were outside screaming their vile slogans and holding up really horrible signs, um, casting judgment and hate with every word, undermining the love of God for all the world to see, and yet doing it in the name of Jesus. 
Then I would pass through the doors into the lobby where inside were members of our own denomination who were having their own loud vocal demonstrations of a per permissive liberal at the time ignorance, each word undermining God's holiness for all the world to see and doing it in the name of Jesus, saying God doesn't really care what we do. So on the outside you hear God hates and on the inside you hear God doesn't care. And both of those are wrong. And neither, neither showing the character of Jesus Christ. Both groups claimed to be Christian, and yet in both groups there was a pride, an arrogance that was inconsistent with the nature, the character of Jesus Christ. Both of them needed to read 1 John. You know, unfortunately, in many ways, those same problems can find them their way into us as individuals. You know, pride is pernicious and it roots itself in our hearts on a regular basis. At some point in time, all of us will fall victim to its siren call and the desire to twist the light to accommodate our own personal shadows. We need to be careful. John says, be aware of self-deceit. Thankfully, being perfect or sinless is not actually what John means by walking in the light. You know, it would be so easy to read John's writings and think only those who live right are walking in the light. But I keep stumbling. I keep messing up. So obviously, I'm not good enough. I'm not a child of the light. I'm not walking in the light. I'm, I'm not a Christian. But as you read through these three tests, I hope that you can see that John is absolutely not saying we need to be sinless or perfect, although of course we should always be striving towards that. But in fact, each of these statements says the exact opposite. The fundamental reality of our self-identity is that we are sinful beings. That's what John says here. If we were sin sinless or perfect, there would be no reason for Jesus cleansing us from our sins. There'd be no need for it. But there it is in the passage. And there would be no reason for the following two statements as well, where John explicitly states that if we claim we are sinners or sinless, that we are liars and that we also make God out to be a liar. None of us is perfect or sinless. And so sinless perfection cannot mean, be what John means by walking in the light. So what does he mean? See, all the three of these statements give us an indication of what John means by walking in the light. These tests that John gives us warn us of the problem of self-deception and then point us to an actual lived reality, who we really are and who God really is, and then to the actual answer, what we need to be doing, a humble dependence upon Jesus Christ. In all three of those cases, in all three statements, Jesus Christ is the answer. You know, and that's why pride just cannot find a place in, within the Christian existence. You know, our entire life is at the feet of our Savior, not based in our own righteousness, but wholly based in His Jesus, as John says here, Jesus is the one who cleanses us from our sins. Jesus is the one who is faithful and, and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Jesus is the righteous one and is the one who is our advocate and who is the one who is the very propitiation for our sins. John tells us over and over again, the answer is Jesus. He is the light. We can never claim to be the light ourselves. We can never claim that we are better than another person, but can only humbly confess our need for a savior. And then the love that, that he has loved us needs to be shown in that same humility. You know, the heart of the Christian walk is not in perfection or in permission, but in confession. In fact, confession is the critical step, repentance, the critical step on our way to perfection. God is doing something in us and it starts when we humbly admit that we are not able to do it on our own, that we are not the light, that we need him. John's going to go on to more explicitly uh, 
define what it means to walk in the light as he goes throughout this letter. But spoiler alert, it's going to look exactly like the character of Jesus Christ. It's quite simply to love one another as he has loved us, to walk in truth with humility, acknowledging our dependence upon God's grace, not looking down on others, but displaying the same loving character of Jesus, the humility of knowing we don't deserve this, we can't and never will deserve this, but that we have been given this precious gift of life and it, that gift is ours to share in love. Love one another as I have loved you. This is what it means to walk in the light, to be with him and therefore like him. And John tells us to take this seriously, that we have to live it, that the discipline of confession is so important for us and the freedom of humility you know, to truly know that I can, I can let go of my pride. I'm never going to be good enough, so why pretend? And at the same time, that I can let go of my shame. No one's ever going to be good enough. And that's why Christ has come to save us. This is what it means to walk in the light, to depend upon Him. You know, the Christian faith is built on grace and grace alone. It is not in deceiving ourselves with false permission or with false perfection, but to stand in confession and know that we have a God who loves us enough to take us and shape us in his own image once more, to display his love and holiness. And this is what our eternal destination is. All who acknowledge their need for Jesus Christ will be welcomed and forgiven and transformed. So step out of the shadows. Don't try to define it yourself, but step into the light of grace and let God redefine who you are. Would you pray with me? Lord God, come once more in Jesus Christ to reshape who we are. Remind us that who we have been does no longer define us, but who you have been in Jesus Christ. And Lord, may that shape us each day that we might walk in the light, showing your love, striving for your holiness and falling on your grace. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's continue to worship God.
What a joy it is to celebrate the Lord's Supper with all of you today. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we remember Jesus' words, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to bring forgiveness of sins and abundant life to all who believe in him. Through the Holy Spirit, you are present with us, just as certain as the bread and juice are on this table. Use this meal, gracious God, to draw us closer to you, and then to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and then drive us outward to be your ambassadors as we bear God's image to the world. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, He broke it, and he said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, at the end of the meal, Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take this and drink it, And when you do, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat from the bread and drink from the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. As you share the bread, share it with the words, the body of Christ broken for you. As you share from the cup, share it with the words, the blood of Christ shed for you. Gracious God, through this holy sacrament, you have met us individually and as a faith family. Your body was broken for us. Your blood was shed for us. Amazing love. How can it be? God, through this sacrament, unite us more closely to you and to your heart. God, may the things that break your heart break ours as well. Through this sacrament, unite us to our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are part of the Westminster family, those who live here in the valley, and our brothers and sisters around the world. Unite us, O God, in purpose as we make a renewed commitment to be God's people and the light and life and love of Jesus Christ in our community. God, as we reflect on the current issues of this day and events of this past week, God, I pray for the safety of all of our elected officials God, may we pray for the safety of our officials, whether we support their political views or not. God, I pray for our leaders, 
that you will give them wisdom. Give them your sense of justice. Give them your peace. God, empower us and equip us through your Holy Spirit to be agents of justice, your agents of peace and hope in our homes and in our neighborhoods, in the places where we work and volunteer. God, even while there is um, increased tension in the Middle East, God, give us your peace. God, even as so many are feeling hopeless as the COVID virus continues, give us a hope in you. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Empower us because we cannot do it of ourselves. We are weak, but you are strong. We are not God, and yet you have all that we could ever need, all that we could ever hope for. So God, unite us for our good and for your ultimate glory. Hear us now as we pray the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, friends, so often life gets a little complicated and it becomes difficult for us to discern what our eyes are really seeing. There's so many things that strive to deceive us, including our own hearts. So when that happens, turn once more to the light. Step into the presence of God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to reclaim, redeem, restore, and renew us. Let his light shine in you and through you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you.